Good afternoon. I'm Lily Bayer, a reporter here at Politico in Brussels. I'd like to welcome our audience here in our Brussels newsroom and also those of you following online. Welcome. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping items. You can send in questions via Slido. Please also include your name. And you can also tweet your questions to at LivePolitico. Uh, when you use Slido, please make sure to use the hashtag PoliticoStoltenberg. Next week, NATO leaders will be assembling in Madrid for what will surely be a very historic summit. Over the past weeks, diplomats and officials over at NATO headquarters on the other side of town have been very busy negotiating the alliance's next long-term strategy and also figuring out how to address the security challenges stemming from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And to talk about all of this ahead of next week's historic summit, we have a very special guest, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Um, the Secretary General will now join us on stage. He will give a few remarks, and after his remarks, we will have a conversation and take questions from the audience. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this uh, welcome. Good afternoon to all of you, and uh, many thanks to Politico for hosting this uh, event and for giving me the opportunity to address uh, the main issues we are going to um, address when all the NATO heads of state and government meet in Madrid next uh, week. And I really expect that this uh, summit in Madrid will be a transformative uh, summit uh, because we are at a pivotal time for our security. President Putin's uh, war against Ukraine is the most urgent threat we face. It has shattered peace in Europe. At the same time, we must not forget all the other challenges to our security. Competition is rising uh, between democracy and authoritarianism. Moscow and Beijing are openly contesting the rules-based international order. Terrorism and nuclear prol proliferation persist. And cyber attacks uh, and climate disruptions are on the rise. All of this affects our security. Faced with this new security reality, NATO continues to adapt. At the summit in Madrid, uh, we will take decisions to strengthen our alliance and keep it agile in this more dangerous world. Let me highlight five areas. First, strengthening our defenses. We will do more to ensure we can defend every inch of allied territory at all times and against any threat. We will adapt the NATO force structure with more forces at high readiness. We will also have more NATO forward deployed uh, combat formations to strengthen battle groups in the East up to brigade level and more pre-positioned equipment and weapon stockpiles. And for the first time since the Cold War, we will have pre-assigned forces to defend specific allies so that we can reinforce much fast faster if needed. All of this builds uh, on the substantial adaptation we have already done since 2014 when Russia illegally annexed Crimea. Second, we will agree a new strategic concept for NATO to guide NATO in a radically changed security environment. I expect the 2022 concept will refer to Russia as the most significant and direct threat to our security. It will address a lot of other challenges that are hardly mentioned in the current strategic concept, including climate change, cyber, hybrid and space. And for the first time, we will address China and the challenges it poses to our interests, security and values. In this context, I welcome that the leaders of our Asia-Pacific partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea, will take part in our summit for the first time. This brings me to my third point, NATO partnerships. We will strengthen our support to Ukraine and other partners at risk. 
I'm pleased that President Zelensky will address our summit. Ukraine is, a critical, is in, a, in a critical situation and there is an urgent need to step up our support. At the summit, we will agree a new comprehensive assistance package for Ukraine. It is composed of concrete projects to assist in the short term, including with anti-drone equipment, secure communications and fuel. But importantly, we will also look at the longer term, including by assisting Ukraine to transition from Soviet era military equipment to modern NATO equipment, boosting interoperability and further strengthening its defense and security institutions. All of this builds uh, on the significant support provided to Ukraine by NATO and NATO allies since 2014, as well as training and equipping Ukrainian forces, in addition to financial, humanitarian and military aid. We will also uh, continue to do more for other partners vulnerable to Russian threats and interference, including Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, by stepping up more uh, political and practical support for these partners to help strengthen their resilience and prevent any further aggression. Allies are unwavering in their support for the right of each nation to choose its own path. This is also Finland's and Sweden's right. And this is my fourth point. Their decisions to apply for NATO membership are historic. We are now working uh, actively on the next steps uh, in the accession process of both Finland and Sweden. And addressing Turkey's security concerns, including in the fight against terrorism. My aim is to find a common way forward so that both countries can join our alliance as soon as possible. This will make them safer, NATO stronger and the Euro-Atlantic area more secure. The fifth and last point is burden sharing. In Madrid, we will recommit the, to the pledge we made in 2014 to spend at least 2% of GDP on defence. More allies now reach or exceed this target. A majority have clear plans to reach it. And more and more allies see 2% as a floor, not a ceiling. Allies are also investing more in modern capabilities and contributing to NATO deployments and exercises. This is the right trend. It shows a real commitment to greater burden sharing across the whole alliance. We must continue to invest more and invest more together in NATO. I can tell you that according to NATO Commission polling ahead of the summit, nearly 80% of allied citizens support maintaining or increasing defense spending. The same polls indicate uh, that support for NATO membership is at a very high level. Over 70% support their country's membership in NATO. So support continues to rise and this matters because a strong NATO is essential to preserve peace, prevent conflict and protect our people and our values now and in the future. Thank you so much and then I'm ready for your questions. Thank you so much. To start off with something that is um, you know, really on the minds of a lot of leaders and citizens <coughs> at the moment, the defense plans for the eastern flank. Um, you talked about plans for, for boosting defenses, for you know, putting more equipment and troops on the ground. But the model <coughs> you described with a lot of pre-assigned forces to defend the eastern flank, do you think that will be enough to really reassure citizens in places such as the Baltic states that they are safe? So NATO will always do what it takes uh, to protect and defend all allies. Uh, and uh, we have to understand that what we will agree in Madrid comes on top of a substantial change that has taken place over the last years. It is not as if NATO suddenly woke up uh, on the 24th of February and realized that we had a challenge with Russia in, in Europe. We were very well prepared. Uh, this was an invasion that was 
predicted, foreseen by our intelligence services, and we shared that intelligence uh, uh, with the broader public uh, last fall. Uh, and actually, since 2014, uh, we have uh, implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War. Uh, this war actually didn't start, um, uh, the war in Ukraine didn't, did, did, did not start in February, it started in 2014. What we saw in February was an uh, escalation with, uh, with uh, the second invasion uh, by Russian forces. Uh, and when that happened, we were, well aware, we were very well prepared uh, because since 2014, we have for the first time in our history uh, deployed combat ready troops to the eastern part of the alliance, to so the Baltic countries and Poland, and increased readiness of our forces and increased defense spending. Since February, uh, we have doubled the number of uh, battle groups from four to eight, increased the size of the battle groups, uh, for instance, in, 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 in Lithuania, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Estonia, and also in Latvia. And then the United States have um, increased the number of uh, US troops in Europe from roughly 70,000 to more than 100,000 over these last months. Uh, and then uh, we now have now more than 40,000 troops under direct NATO command in the eastern part of the alliance. I, I just remind you all of this because I guess you know that, uh, but, but this is just the starting point for where we then will take new decisions uh, and those decisions will be, uh, uh, when it comes to the land uh, domain, the land forces will be based on partly even more combat forces forward deployed. Uh, uh, more pre-positioned equipment. I think if anything, um, uh, if there's any lesson to be learned from Ukraine, it's the importance of heavy equipment in place, but also fuel, uh, ammunition, uh, supplies. Um, uh, and then we will also have then pre-assigned forces that will exercise train in their home country, but will then have worked with um, and know well the terrain, the countries where they are supposed to be uh, deployed if needed. This is exactly what Germany just announced, up to brigade level, more for presence, more pre-position equipment, but then a pre-assigned uh, brigade in Germany that can uh, easily and quickly move to Lithuania if uh, needed. Uh, then there will be many other decisions on cyber, hybrid, space, and, and uh, other domains. Uh, but, but this is a significant increase, and, and this just demonstrates that NATO is there to protect and defend all allies. Thank you. Uh, Ukraine's ambassador to the EU, Ambassador <coughs> uh, Chensov, was asked by reporters this week about your recent comments that the war in Ukraine could last years. And his response to the reporters was that these predictions are, quote, not helpful. What he said is, quote, we need a lot of weapons and now, and this should change the situation. How would you respond to the Ukrainian ambassador? Well, first of all, I think that uh, my message has been and still is that uh, wars are unpredictable. Uh, we uh, predicted very precisely the invasion uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and we shared that information. Uh, but since then, it has been very hard to predict the, uh, how this war uh, evolves. Uh, and, and, and that's because uh, the outcome of war is a combination of capabilities, uh, but also the will uh, and the... And the and the courage and the, and the commitment and the morale. And what we have seen, which I think has uh, impressed the whole world, is, uh, is, uh, is the, the, the bravery, the courage of the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, their will to, uh, to stand up against the brutal uh, Russian invasion, uh, and, uh, and also the Ukrainian political leadership and, uh, and the Ukrainian people. And that has imp impressed the whole world, and, and it just... Uh, also demonstrate that uh, President Putin totally underestimated the strength of the Ukrainian uh, 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 resistance and the ability to stand up against them. So then uh, my message uh, has been and still is that uh, 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 since it's hard to predict, uh, we should be careful uh, about uh, drawing any uh, certain conclusions about how long this war may last. It may last for uh, weeks, months, uh, but also for years. Uh, the, the political message is that regardless of how long the war lasts, we need to be prepared for long haul uh, and to be prepared to continue to provide uh, uh, substantial support uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, I think we all would like to see an end to this war as soon as possible, but at the same time, the Ukrainians, and I totally agree with them, that of course they will not surrender. They are fighting for their independence, for their sovereignty, and we need to provide support to them uh, and ensure that they can prevail as a sovereign, independent nation in Ukraine.
You talked about preparing for the long haul. In some NATO capitals, there is, um, I think, some growing questions right now about whether the support for Ukraine politically and also logistically and financially is sustainable. Um, how long do you see NATO countries being able to keep up um, the supply of weapons to Ukraine at current levels? As long as necessary. I mean, th that's my whole, uh, my whole message, is that we need to be prepared for long haul. I cannot tell you exactly how long this war will last, but I just tell the decision makers uh, in NATO capitals, in parliaments, the, the public opinion, that we have a political and a moral obligation to provide support, substantial support, for a long time, as long as it takes. Partly because when we started to, do, to, to provide support, we actually took on some kind of responsibility. You cannot stop in the middle of that effort. Because they are in the middle of a war. And it's not as that, that of course, I realize that this has a, con a cost for, 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 for NATO allies. Uh, because it costs, of course, to deliver weapons. It costs something politically. And, of course, they also have the consequences of the, of the sanctions. But those costs are, first of all, much smaller than the cost the Ukrainians are willing to pay for their freedom and their independence. So, therefore, we should be uh, willing to pay our uh, part of that. Uh, which is much smaller. Second, the price we risk to pay if Putin gets his way by using military force against the independent democratic uh, state uh, nation in, uh, in Europe uh, will uh, be much higher than the price we pay today to support Ukraine. So, so, so that's, that's my message in all these speeches and interventions, that just be prepared for long haul. Uh, 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 wars are unpredictable, uh, they are bloody, uh, uh, and this is now turning into a war of attrition, and that makes it just even more important that we continue uh, our support. And I'm absolutely certain that the message from NATO allies uh, will be that we should uh, maintain support, uh, 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 deliver also uh, modern weapons, uh, heavy weapons, uh, as NATO allies have now done for a long time, uh, and also that NATO has a role uh, to play in providing support. Let me, on this question of whether we have the, the, the staying power, I would like to remind uh, uh, also all about the fact that NATO and NATO allies have actually supported Ukraine since 2014. I was in, um, in this training uh, uh, camp. Uh, that was bombed very early in the in the in the war in 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 western uh, Ukraine. I was there, uh, Yavoriv, I think. You know, I was there in in 2015, and there I saw how NATO, Canadian troops, uh, UK, the United States trained uh, 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 and equipped uh, Ukrainian forces, forces which are now essential for the defense of of Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, and also Turkey has, uh, has provided essential equipment to, uh, to uh, Ukraine for many years. So yes, we have stepped up and more allies are now helping uh, since the invasion, but we actually, NATO allies, have been and should continue to be ready for the long haul because uh, we cannot allow uh, 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 Putin to, uh, to, to in a way see that he is rewarded for his brutal use of force. I see we have quite a few questions from the audience on Turkey specifically. So I think Turkey's decision to block um, the accession of uh, Sweden and Finland caught a lot of allies by <coughs> surprise. You've been in talks for, for many weeks now behind closed doors. Do you believe that this public display of disunity could hurt NATO's credibility? And um, I'm asking this also because we're getting a ton of questions uh, from the audience um, about Turkey's role as an ally. Yeah. So first of all, there are, there are different views in NATO on many issues. That has always been the case. And sometimes I remind people of the fact that uh, uh, back in the 1950s we had the Suez Crisis, where we actually have two allies moving into the Suez Canal and then some allies not being prepared for that at all. Uh, uh, we, had, uh, we had in the 1960s, we had uh, France leaving the military uh, structures of the NATO uh, alliance, and NATO had to move its headquarters from Paris to Brussels. Uh, in the 70s, we had disagreements among allies on, on the colonial war in, in Africa by some allies and, uh, and also the Vietnam War. And then we had uh, huge disagreements among NATO allies on the Iraq War and there are many other disagreements. So you can, I, can, I can actually sit here for hours and, and, and go into details about the disagreements between allies. Uh, and that's not a surprising thing because we are 30 different nations 
with uh, different political parties in power, different history, different geography from both sides of the Atlantic. So, of course, there are differences. The impressive thing with NATO is that despite the fact that we are 30 different allies from uh, uh, yeah, with different uh, uh, views on many issues, that we agree so on so uh, many things and that we always agree on the essential issues that we are ready to protect and defend each other. So I'm confident that we also agree uh, on Finland and Sweden, but then we have to do what we always do in NATO, and that is to sit down uh, and address uh, um, differences uh, and concerns when they are clearly expressed by allies, as Turkey has expressed now. Um, uh, because we also have to recognize that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Turkey is the country, uh, the NATO ally, that has suffered the most terrorist attacks. Uh, it's a country which is of great importance for our alliance, bordering Iraq and Syria. They, they played and is still playing a key role in the fight against terrorism. Uh, and they also play a key role as a black sea nation. Uh, and they, for instance, now uh, 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 do very important work or uh, uh, facilitate talks uh, on trying to, uh, to, to get food out of Ukraine. So, so, so when they raise concerns, of course, we have to sit down uh, and then address those concerns. And that's exactly what we now are consulting on. And then, uh, and then I hope that we can find a solution to allow Finland and Sweden to become members as soon as possible. But do you feel that you're being held hostage by Turkey? We all understand that there are disagreements and debates within any group or organization. But do you feel that you're unable to move forward with something of key strategic importance because one member is holding you back? But, but when we have a system where we are based on consensus, uh, that's the way we make decisions in, uh, in NATO, then there will often be a situation where one or a few allies disagree with the rest. Uh, and, uh, and then we need to overcome them. Uh, and this is not the first time we see one or just a few allies this, uh, not agreeing with, with the rest. But I, then, as it, this is not, this has, they, they applied for not so many weeks ago. Uh, and my aim is still to make sure that they can join uh, without, also soon. I cannot, I cannot guarantee, but I'm saying that's still my aim. Um, uh, uh, and, then, and then, as has happened before, also when you speak about accession processes, uh, we just need to take into account that not all allies have the same starting point and then find a way to reconcile and find common ground. And that's exactly what we're working on now. Uh, moving on to an issue that has been in the headlines over the past few days, um, Russia has warned Lithuania of serious consequences after it banned the rail transfer of some goods to Kaliningrad. Are you concerned about a possible escalation in the region? Are you in touch with the leadership in Lithuania about this issue? So we are in constant uh, touch with uh, all NATO allies, of course, also with Lithuania. Um, they, uh, they briefed NATO allies on this uh, 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 earlier this, uh, this, uh, this week, and, uh, and of course Li Lithuania participates in all, all our meetings, so the, we, have, we have also daily contact with Lithuania at different levels. Um, um, uh, what we see is that uh, uh, Lithuania, uh, a NATO ally, but also of course an EU member, they apply the EU agreed sanctions, uh, and the NATO allies uh, have also imposed sanctions, uh, and uh, and NATO allies um, uh, support the EU sanctions uh, because it has to have consequences when uh, President Putin uh, violates international law and, uh, and launches a brutal attack against the neighbor. Um, let's go then to some questions from the audience. Um, there's one question from uh, a Portuguese uh, member of the audience. How will China fit in NATO's future strategic concept? Will China be <coughs> a lesser threat to the alliance or continue to be a major future threat? I'm confident that uh, in the, the next strategic concept that will be agreed uh, when uh, NATO leaders meet in Madrid next week, uh, we will address uh, uh, China and, and, and the uh, consequences for our uh, security. I think you have to understand that for NATO this is a, this is a big step uh, because in the current strategic concept, China is not mentioned with a single word. Uh, that concept was agreed at the summit in Lisbon in 2010. I was there as a NATO uh, prime, in, uh, prime in, uh, in Norwegian prime, uh, prime minister, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and the world has really changed since then, and that will be reflected in the strategic concept. At that summit in Lisbon, uh, at that time, President Medvedev of Russia participated in the summit. 
together with us. And we agreed in that strategic concept that, that, that Russia is a strategic partner and that the Euro-Atlantic area was at peace. That, that will not be the case now. We will not state that the Euro-Atlantic area is at peace. Actually, there's a war going on in Europe. We will not refer to, China, to, to, to Russia as a strategic partner. And on China, uh, uh, we don't regard China as an adversary, uh, uh, but we need to realize that the rise of China, the fact that they are investing heavily in new modern military equipment, including uh, scaling uh, significantly up their uh, nuclear capabilities, investing in key technologies, uh, and, and trying also to control in critical infrastructure in Europe, coming closer to us, um, uh, uh, makes it important for us to also address that. So, so I'm, I, 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 I expect that allies will state that China poses some challenges to our, to our values, to our interests, to our, to our security, and, that, and this, of course, has a, uh, uh, an impact also on uh, how NATO should react in a more competitive world. There is one super interesting question from the audience. How is NATO preparing for a relationship with a post-Putin Russia? As our main focus now, and the urgent need now, is to support Ukraine. Uh, also fundamentally, NATO has two tasks. Provide support to Ukraine, NATO allies and NATO, uh, and NATO provide support to Ukraine. Uh, done so since 2014, uh, but have stepped up, of course, since uh, the uh, invasion. And the comprehensive assistance package, I expect that allies will agree next week, will also uh, um, focus on the more long-term cooperation with Ukraine, including this transition from Soviet air equipment uh, to NATO standard modern equipment and modernize the defense and security institutions. So the first task is support to Ukraine. Uh, to ensure that they prevail as a sovereign independent nation in Europe. Second task is to prevent escalation. We have to remember that there is a constant risk for escalation. And it's really bad what is going on in Ukraine now, with all the people killed and the casualties and the brutality we see there. But of course this can become worse if this escalates into a full-fledged war between Russia and Europe. And therefore NATO's other main task is of course to prevent escalation. We do that by not being directly involved uh, on the ground, and we do it by significantly increase our military presence in the Eastern part of the Alliance, so there's no room for misunderstanding, miscalculation in Moscow about NATO's readiness to protect all allies. This is deterrence, and the purpose of deterrence is to not provoke conflict, but to prevent conflict, pre preserve peace, and that's the reason why we strengthen our deterrence and defense. I say this because this is a huge task, extremely important, that we both succeed in providing support to Ukraine, but also prevent uh, escalation. Um, uh, uh, we cannot continue with... Uh, Russia has totally abandoned the idea of a constructive working relationship with them, because they have violated uh, so, so blatantly international law, trust, and invaded uh, a close partner of NATO, Ukraine. Uh, but of course we need some kind of military lines of communications to prevent escalation, uh, uh, instance accidents, and if they happen, prevent them from spiraling out of control. Uh, uh, Russia is still there, uh, and, um, and, 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 and at some time also, hopefully it's possible to also engage in arms control agreements. Uh, but 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 the, the 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 relationship which strived for to establish with Russia for many years a, 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 a more um, constructive relationship, that's uh, that's not possible now. And then uh, Russia has to change their behavior before before we can go back to anything that uh, um, is more similar to the relationship we strive for before. So I, I'm not speculate about what, when, and how that can happen. Uh, uh, we will provide support to Ukraine and prevent escalation. That's the urgent task. So before we let you go, because I know you have a lot of preparations for the summit, uh, maybe one more personal question, because um, as everyone here is aware, you decided to stay on an extra year beyond your term in part due to the crisis. And I think we're all curious sometimes when, you know, we see you at press conferences and ministerials, what is your favorite thing <coughs> about this job and what is your least favorite thing about this job? Also my favorite and my least favorite thing with this job is the same. And that is that I had to work with 30 nations. <laughs> That's a great thing when we agree. Uh, and I feel, you know, really that we, all, we, we, are, we are doing some big things together when 30 allies uh, agree uh, uh, and, and, and make decisions together to protect uh, and, uh, and defend each other. Then I have to admit that sometimes it's a bit, uh, I would say, challenging uh, to ensure that all 30 allies agree. 
uh, uh, but I think in a way the reward is that when we manage it's such a big price because we have to remember that we are one billion people, 30 nations, 50% um, uh, of the world's GDP and 50% of the world's uh, military might. Uh, and, uh, and of course we have North America but we also have, uh, have Europe. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, if Finland and Sweden, or when Finland and Sweden joins NATO, 96% of the EU pop population will live in a NATO country. And then on top of that, you have 150 million Europeans outside the European Union, but in NATO. So, 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 so this is really representing Europe and North America. And I strongly believe that the only way to preserve peace, uh, the only way to manage a much more unpredictable, dangerous uh, world, is to ensure that North America and Europe stand together. And, and, and that's not easy, but extremely important. Therefore, uh, the best and the worst thing is to work with 30 allies. And I like them very much, actually. That's the reason why I decided to stay on. Thank you very much for your time, Secretary General. Thank you to the audience, both in the room and online, for joining us. If you have any feedback, feel free to email live at politico.eu. You can also go to politico.eu slash events to find out about future panels and discussions and interviews. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.